Well, there should be at least two significant things or ideas that pop out to us from our reading in Luke chapter 15, the infamous prodigal son parable. And both of those things should actually speak to us regarding the nature of God's love and his mercy and his grace for us in his resurrection and his incredible ability to overcome our sin and its shame. Right? The first is this. First century Jerusalem men did not run. Period. All right? And they certainly did not run to their sons who had humiliated them, essentially told them they were no longer needed in their life or wanted in their life, basically saying to dad, you're dead to me. And who had done any number of humiliating and unimaginable things to an upright, outstanding man full of integrity in the community. Fathers did not run to their sons. And they especially did not run to them who had treated them in such a fashion. The second is this, by all accounts, the son who was dead to the family most certainly smelled as if he was dead and was in no way, shape, or form in a place where he should return to his family. The second point is the son no longer belonged. And because the son no longer belonged, it should be all the more startling that the father reacts the way he does in Jesus' parable, that he runs towards this son with excitement and with anticipation. Yet there is a drastic point that Jesus is trying to make in telling this parable that involves the prodigal son and the one who is seemingly dead to his family and the father who does the unexpected and runs towards the son. And then, of course, at the end of the parable, you have the son who stayed at home and now must respond to his brother's return. Many of us have heard this parable multiple times. And if you've been paying attention to any national preacher or teacher, you've probably heard sermons on it, especially in the last 10 years, from every possible angle, perspective, and understanding. You've probably heard sermons that have put us in the place as modern disciples who put us in the place of the prodigal son returning to God our Father. You may have heard sermons from the perspective of the son who stayed back and what Jesus is most likely highlighting for the sake of his present audience being the religious leaders of the day and how we should in in repentance rejoice that our dead brother is now back and returns to the kingdom of our Savior and in confession receives the full forgiveness and inheritance of God each and every time. And I don't really know which sermon you might need to hear today. But I draw that out because as we dive into it this morning, it brings to reality the two very dramatic points in the parable of the prodigal son. First century Jerusalem men did not run And the son does not belong. Those two points are the very reason that this parable brings us hope in our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Both points should actually give us cause to to pause and, and consider our relationship with God, our Father, and how everything is new, everything is different, everything is transformative. Now that Christ is risen, He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. So grab your Bibles and go with me to Luke chapter 15. Because we're going to dive into the first point, that first century Jerusalem men do not, did not run. Luke chapter 15. About two-thirds of the way through, the Bible's in front of you. Third gospel, Luke 15. We're going to start at verse 1. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, meaning Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents 
than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus doesn't waste any time responding to the grumbling of the scribes and the Pharisees. And just a quick history lesson in case you've forgotten or you weren't aware, Pharisees were a group of men in first century Judaism that had deeply studied the laws of God in the Old Testament. And they lived with strict adherence as well as to the, to the laws in the Old Testament as well as the additional laws and customs often referred to as the laws of the fathers. Which those weren't actually biblical but more interpretations from rabbinic teachings regarding the Old Testament laws and commands. And they were strictly adherent to all of them. Scribes were a similar group of people, but who also held, were held responsible for preparation of legal documents, such as marriages, land ownerships, etc., etc., according to Old Testament law. And so these are the people that are grumbling against Jesus eating with the sinners and the tax collectors. They could not wrap their minds around two main ideas. The first being that Jesus might actually be the son of David, the son of God, promised and prophesied throughout the Old Testament. And two, that if he truly was the son of God, why in the world would Jesus go to the ones who were the furthest away from God's laws and God's commands? Why would God go to those unfaithful, worthless people? Those are the, those, that's the mindset of the people grumbling against Jesus. So what Jesus ends up highlighting here throughout the chapter of Luke 15 and the parable of the prodigal son is that God's reaction to the one who has gone so incredibly far from his, from his love and his truth is the exact opposite reaction of the religious leaders of the day. In fact, Jesus tries to highlight that the deeper the shame, the deeper the guilt, the seemingly faster the father runs to the individual. Let that sink in for a second. Because first century Jewish men did not run. And they certainly did not run to the dead sons who had humiliated them, who had dragged their name through the mud, quite literally. Yet that is exactly the picture that God in the flesh, God incarnate, our Savior Jesus Christ, paints in the minds of the religious elite regarding God's love for the very ones who are seemingly the farthest away from His truth and mercy. Which brings us back to the second dramatic point of this parable. The Son did not belong. And neither do we. You see, what the religious leaders don't realize when they're listening to this parable, and what we too often don't realize either, is that you and I aren't even really the brother who remains steadfast and at home. We are all actually the son who never belonged because we've all ventured so incredibly far from the truth of God our Father that there have been times when our relationship with Him has been almost imperceivable, if not completely broken and dead, that might be the season of life that you're currently in. You and I, the religious leaders of the day, cannot say that we have been 100% faithful to God our Father through thick and thin, through every experience, through it all. In fact, at best we can say we've been like the prodigal son and we've squandered the incredible blessings and mercy that God has given to us. But again, as Jesus says this parable, the Father does what He should not do. And He ran to the Son who no longer belongs. Verse 20. And the Son, the one who doesn't belong, arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he felt compassion, and he ran 
And he embraced him and he kissed him. And the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father says to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, put shoes on his feet. Essentially bring him back into the family and bring the fattened calf and let's kill it. Let's eat, let's celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. And they all began to celebrate. See, this is actually what we are celebrating as we continue to rejoice in the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are rejoicing and we are celebrating the reality that God has done more than just run to us. He's done more than simply throw us a party. He has done what the Father does in this parable, and then he brings us back to life. And he welcomes us who do not belong in his presence back into his presence. And he puts upon us a robe of joy and hope and forgiveness. And our Father himself has a bigger joy than you and I could ever imagine. When he gets to look at each and every one of us. And he gets to tell us your sins are forgiven. My child, who once was lost, who once was dead, you are now alive. We got to witness it in Ryder's life today. So whatever guilt or shame you've had in this life, whatever ways you've turned from God or maybe you've told him that you don't need him or that he doesn't exist in your world, none of that matters. Because none of that has stopped him from racing to meet you and me today where we are. And none of that has stopped him from putting his robe of forgiveness and life and love around us. First century Jewish men may not have run. And the prodigal son most certainly did not belong. But God has run to us. He has run to us to overcome our shame and our guilt with his mercy and his grace. And now all of heaven, all of heaven rejoices that you and I belong as sons and daughters of God in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. 